Hi, good day. Um, I'm, I'm calling from the uh, from the United States of America, where it's now yesterday to you. <laughs> it's very late here on December seventh. I think uh, most of you are in December eighth. <laughs> Um, so welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons, or IESC's uh, fourth annual World Commons Week event, and thank you for attending. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm the president-elect of IESC, and I'm the co-organizer of the World Commons Week 22 event. Uh, as you may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event where we're celebrating and promoting commons research and practice. Uh, and this is the keynote webinar for the IESC Asia region. I'd like to thank my colleague Mansi, who's here, who serves in the role as IESC's regional coordinator for Asia and who organized this webinar. Let me, let me explain how the, the webinar will work. I, we've asked the, our keynote speaker to speak for approximately 35 to 40 minutes. Um, I'll act as a timer and I can signal when there's about five minutes left. Uh, the last 10, 15 minutes of the session will be left for qu questions and answers. And uh, Mansi and we'll, we'll moderate those questions. Um, to ensure the webinar functions well, um, we've limited video to the speaker and moderator and the audio for attendees is muted. Uh, the important thing for audience members is the, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, typically there's a Q and A button um, where you can type in questions. So during the talk at any time, feel free to, to do that. And at the end of the talk, Mansi will read your questions and the speaker can respond to them. Um, if it appears that we need to have a dialogue, we can unmute you um, and you can have that dialogue. So let me now turn it over to Mansi for the introduction to our speaker. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And warm greetings to all of you from the uh, IASC family. And I'm um, extremely overwhelmed to actually interact with Eduardo Aral for the first time uh, directly. Of course, I have been uh, looking at his work as well as uh, referring to his work and meeting him at all the IASC conferences. Uh, so I welcome Eduardo for uh, this uh, keynote speech. And before uh, you start your speech, let me quickly uh, uh, take our uh, participants through your brief bio. So Professor Eduardo Eraral is an associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. Ed, as we call in the IASC family, is you know, both an academic and a practitioner with 30 years of experience, including 20 years of Asia, focused advisory consulting for governments, donors, and executive education. He holds a PhD degree in public policy from Indiana University Bloomington on a Fulbright PhD scholarship with Eleanor Ostrom as his supervisor. I think we all are connected uh, with uh, Lynn and Vincent uh, through this wonderful work on commons and collective action. So he specializes in the study of institutions for collective action. He published in public administration review, journal of public administration, uh, research and theory, governance, policy, sciences, and uh, uh, many more, if I have to list them all, and I'm going to put them in the chat box. His awards include fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral uh, Sciences at Stanford University and fellow at the Research Centers of three Nobel laureates in economics. He received uh, the 2013 Ostrom Prize for Governance of the Common, the Fulbright PhD Award. And again, the list is long, so I will keep it in the chat box for all of you. As a practitioner, Ed has a large and active portfolio of government advisory consulti consultancy, ed executive education, and media engagement. His leadership record includes stints as vice dean for research and assistant dean for academic and affairs at LKYSPT. We, he served in three editorial boards, in, uh, is, is a co-editor of the Cambridge University Press, associate editor at Oxford University Press, and peer review uh, for many journals. He was also co-editor for the Institute of Water Policy, vice chairman of Asia Pacific Water Forum, and principal investigator of the program of AI, blockchain, cloud, and data at the LKY School. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you here, Ed, and we are really looking forward to uh, have your uh, speech on collective action in commons, and particularly looking at the state of the art. So over to you, Eduardo, and floor is yours. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Mansi, for that warm introduction, and to Charlie for uh, inviting me and organizing this uh, event today. Thank, thank you very much for you both. Um, the uh, topic of my talk today is on uh, a state of the art for collective action in the commons. It's a very broad topic, but uh, mostly it dwells on my work and the work of colleagues working in, uh, in uh, Asia. Uh, let me probably jump quickly to uh, what I thought we have learned so far on collective action in the commons. Uh, I, I'll divide my talk in, in three parts. I'll talk first about what we have learned about traditional commons, the stuff that we study at IASC on forestry, fisheries, irrigation, watershed, uh, grazing and, and, and fisheries and all that. And then I'll talk about some of my work on global commons, and I'll conclude with some thoughts on an emerging field on the study of urban commons. Of course, other colleagues have started to now explore uh, uh, commons in space, but I will not uh, dwell, dwell on that. Um, so if you look at the literature on traditional Commons, mostly published in ISC Journal, in IJC and World Development, and some uh, related literature. I ha I took a look at them and uh, I look at what the scholars have been studying, what variables they're looking at, what were the conclusions and findings. Um, those findings can be categorized in a few a few keywords that I highlighted here. First one is on the role of community. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, the, the importance of decentralization and participation where Lid studied uh, quite a few examples here in Asia, especially in, in, in uh, Nepal, in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. The role of uh, heterogeneity uh, in collective action the role of property rights and uh, enforcement. Ruth Mainsendik and her colleagues at Capri have studied irrigation uh, uh, set in irrigation settings and they've spent a good deal of their time studying the role of property rights. Uh, quite a few scholars have studied the role of group size on collective action, arguing, some argue, as Manchur also did, that uh, group size uh, collective action is negatively correlated with group size. Others disagree with that and say that it depends on uh, the type of collective action goals that you aspire for. Uh, bigger groups can and are able to contribute more to, uh, to the collective good if there's a bigger size. So it's not necessarily the case that that bigger groups would lead to uh, negative, would have a negative influence on collective action. Uh, and then the issue of resource scarcity, this is well studied. Some argue that the relationship is, uh, is uh, negative. Uh, if a resource is scarce, there'll be more problems of collective action if a resource is not a pro if a resource if there's no resource scarcity, collective action is not a problem. But others would say that the relationship is more inverse. The relationship is U curve, so that there's a debate on on the effect of resource scarcity on collective action. Um, some of the work I did with colleagues uh, from China uh, on the effects of migration on collective action. Uh, I'll talk about that uh, in a short while also the effects of urbanization on collective action in the commons, and then the, robust, the robustness of socio-ecological uh, system. So we've learned quite a bit on uh, the determinants of collective action in the commons, but I'll also briefly talk about uh, collective action in the global commons, and I'll conclude my talk with uh, on collective action in the urban commons. So here's some of the earlier works on collective action. 
Uh, Arun Agrewar, Agrawal and Clark Gibson are familiar names to colleagues in the ISC community. They wrote this paper in 1999 on the role of community natural resource conservation. I think it's already a settled, settled debate that communities play an important role in resource conservation, but uh, communities can also lead to, uh, under certain conditions, uh, they can also lead to degradation of uh, natural resources. Uh, Arun also and his colleague Krishna Gupta looked at uh, the role of decentralization and participation, especially in the case of the Terai in Nepal. Again, this is a settled debate that decentralization and participation does have a positive uh, effect on the co uh, governance of common pool uh, resources. Uh, Ami Potit and Lynn wrote this piece in 2004, looking at how the heterogeneity of groups and group size is mediated by uh, institutions in the case of forest management. Uh, and basically they said that the effect of group size on collective action depend on the type of collective action and depend on the need for uh, resources and institutions uh, can mediate the effects of heterogeneous groups and large groups. So that's that's what we have learned from this uh, debate. Um, my small contribution to the literature published in 2009, I looked at 2018 in world development. I look at the determinants of collective action. This one in the case of irrigation commons in the Philippines. I look at the uh, uh, variables such as water scarcity, proximity to markets, farm size and governance structure. And I found that that, there's, that water scarcity has a curvilinear effect on collective action and is mediated by governance uh, institution. It's not just a one-way thing, but there's a, it's, it's basically a, uh, a mediated uh, effect. Um, this work I did with colleagues uh, Wang Yahua and uh, Chun Chen Cheng in China, 2016, we examined the effects of migration on collective action in China. And the conclusion is that collective action has some negative effect on, uh, migration has an, a negative effect on collective action uh, when people, able-bodied workers, especially men, move from villages to the cities, uh, the irrigation especially surface irrigation uh, gets abandoned. Uh, older people are able to manage the surface irrigation. Then they become abandoned, left over, and then they, they, uh, they deteriorate uh, over time. And communities eventually shift to the use of groundwater pump, pumps and uh, irrigation commons have been abandoned because of the effects of migration. So migration has a negative effect on uh, collective action in the commons. Um, I published this paper in Human Ecology in 2013. I looked at uh, uh, the question on what makes social socio-ecological systems robust. And I look at this 2000 year old Ipugao society in Northern uh, Philippines. Uh, I promise Lynn that I will take a look at this very interesting case study, how the society has survived for more than 2,000 years and uh, uh, how they built their robust institutions, how they settled conflict um, and uh, the, the role of uh, traditional, uh, traditional norms, traditional practices, and despite the effects of modernization, commerce, uh, urbanization, they continued to survive and flourish uh, to this day. Um, uh, I also had a look at this 400-year-old irrigation commons, again, no, in the Northern Philippines. This was one of the case studies that Lynn had a look at. Uh, in her Governing the Commons book in 90, published in 1990. So I told her that I will do a follow-up 
uh, on that case study that, that she looked at. This was originally published in 1980. Lynn examined it in 1990. I came back to it in uh, 2008. So it's been about 40 years since we've been coming back and forth in this uh, Sanghera. So the conclusion of the paper is that uh, the Sangheras have survived for more than 400 years because of their ingenious system of uh, allocating resources, allocating responsibilities in a fair and equitable manner. Uh, if it's fair and equitable, uh, people will contribute to, uh, the, uh, to collective action and the resource will be, and, and the infrastructure of this source will be conserved and most likely will persist in decades uh, to, to, to come. Um, and the key to that is by reducing their uh, transaction costs. This is an interesting case study also on climate adaptation because this system is beset with uh, frequent uh, typhoons. They get visited by more than 20 strong typhoons uh, every year. And they get flooded every year. They get, uh, they get uh, earthquakes that destroys there. And yet they're able to, to survive this uh, extraneous shocks uh, for more than 400 years and they continue to rebuild. So it did not, uh, it did not lead to the collapse of the irrigation commons. So that was the focus of the paper to explain why they have not collapsed for over 400 years. Um, I also promised Lynn that I will do a critical, a critical review and appreciation of her work and Garrett Harding. So this uh, synthesis paper came out in uh, environmental science and policy in 2014, it got uh, a few critical uh, comments and I had to make some uh, rejoinder and rebuttal and explanation. Uh, and you can probably read the arguments why, uh, why I make what I call a critical appreciation and some uh, revisionist view of the hypothesis put forward by, by Lynn. Um, so some colleagues, Michael Cox, uh, Sergio, and Gwen Arnold responded to my, my, my paper, uh, my, my critic, and I also responded to them. So this got some kind of traction in, in the community on whether they agree or disagree with my, uh, my proposition. So we, we, we leave it at that, we, and we let our colleagues read the, the two papers and judge for themselves whether they are uh, agreeable whether they were persuaded or not persuaded by, by the arguments. Um, in Ecology and Society recently, me and my colleagues also published this, again, from China. We looked at migration and collective action, but we used the socio-ecological system framework, but we, we used empirical data from China and we used a lot of fancy econometrics uh, there's a lot of work on socio-ecological systems, uh, especially in ecology and society, but there's not a lot of uh, empirical work uh, that, that uses the SES framework. So our paper is one of those few early papers that uses a lot of empirical work uh, with a focus on migration and uh, collective action use, using the SES uh, framework. Um, this one is fairly recent last year, again, from our work with Chinese colleagues, Chicheng and Yahua. And here we look at the effects of urban proximity on collective action. Uh, and many of the commons that we now study, the traditional ones, are being influenced or impacted by their proximity to markets, uh, through roads, connectivity with roads, with, uh, with, with, with the internet and, uh, and trade and all that. And here in this paper, we look at the effects of urban proximity and we conclude that the effects are actually uh, mediated. And we look at these, what are the 
uh, mediators of uh, the effects of urban proximity. Um, then going going to global commons, me and my colleague Cedric Oras Galier look at the case of the Caspian Sea. If you don't know where Caspian Sea is, that's uh, between Europe and Russia, uh, and just uh, below uh, below Russia, Europe and Asia. It's one of the world's largest freshwater sea or lakes. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting case study. The Caspian Sea is uh, being claimed by six countries. It is rich in fisheries, rich in oil and gas, rich in, um, in, in navigation, oil pipelines. So it's very much contested. Uh, one part of the Caspian Sea, the northern part, has settled their conflict and disputes. They have now cooperated. The southern part have not solved their problem. And our paper looks at why the northern part have sold their, they managed to cooperate, while the southern part have failed to uh, cooperate. As it's an example of a complex uh, a conflict and cooperation in the uh, global commons. Um, we know that uh, global commons are different from local commons. Uh, there's so much we already know about the, the, the local commons, but not much we know about the global commons, except that uh, they vary in terms of number of resource users, salience or actors awareness of degradation. Uh, it's more salient in local commons than in global commons. The distribution of interest and power is also different between local commons and global commons. You have major powers in global commons uh, competing with one another. The issue of cultural and institutional homogeneity is more or less homogeneous in local commons, but quite heterogeneous in global commons. Think about uh, the atmosphere, uh, the open oceans, the space. Uh, in terms of feasibility of learning, it's highly feasible to learn uh, from local commons because of the instantaneous feedback, but this one is quite difficult in terms of global commons because of the size and the, the size of the global commons and the large number of resource users. Uh, local commons is more or less renewable, especially if you have, let's say, irrigation, uh, you have forestry, fisheries, communities are able to protect their uh, precious uh, renewable resources, but this seems to be not the case in global commons where regeneration would take time and uh, over spans of generation. Uh, understanding the resource, resource dynamics is much more complicated for global commons. Think about uh, oceans, Arc the Arctic, the atmosphere compared to local commons. Uh, resource dynamics in local commons more stable. There's some variability, but generally more stable compared to uh, the global commons. So in, in, in short, uh, this uh, global and local commons are very two different animals. They're not one, 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 one and the same, and they have to be studied quite separately. Uh, I now conclude my presentation with a quick through, with quick rundown of uh, uh, what I sense as the emerging debates about urban commons, because much of the world now is getting urbanized, but the study of urban commons is quite incipient. It has not received quite as much attention as we have studied the traditional uh, rural commons. So I define urban commons as valuable resources in urban areas with multiple often contested and conflicting uses and property rights and are faced with problems of regulatory failure and collective action problems. So uh, some of the familiar examples are public and private spaces, city parks, sidewalks, streets, uh, waterways, condominiums. These are what I call as examples of urban commons. Uh, this is one example in China. This is the Yangtze River. The background is Shanghai, but the, the red tide here 
is because of factories using the dumping this river as their garbage garbage bin and everybody suffers because of that pollution in a large larger scale so this is one familiar example and this one is in india a quite familiar example of urban rivers being used as dumping sites uh, this one is in metro manila you can see the smog enveloping this the, uh, the city because of the millions of cars and this is not unique to Manila. You will see this now in, uh, in Beijing, in Delhi, and many other cities uh, in developing countries. So this is uh, urban smog. Um, so obviously, we need to study urban commons because of the problems of congestion, flooding, pollution, issues of equity, fairness, uh, urban livability, and it's a, it's a new field of study. Uh, this one is in China, where bicycles have taken over public commons. Uh, another example of uh, urban commons in China, the nail house, this uh, brave uh, house owner does not want to, to give up his land. And so the property development have to slow down because of uh, hold out, the problem of hold out in the urban commons. Uh, in the Philippines, this uh, park in front of the church has been uh, converted into public market. And I'm sure our colleagues in India can easily relate to these public parks being converted to private uh, enterprises. Uh, again, in the Philippines, this used to be a uh, waterway, a uh, swamp, but then uh, people overtook developers or land speculators overtook this place and converted them into housing. And, and now when every time it's flooded, then everybody suffers. Uh, again, uh, this is a typical problem uh, in many cities around the world. Uh, in Vietnam, locals, uh, tourists go there. This, these are some uh, public spaces in between railways. And this is a, this is a favorite uh, pastime for tourists. Uh, they wait for the train to pass by. I'm sure that you also have this in India as well example of an urban commons. Again, in China, this brave house owner does not want to give up his house in, the, in, in public interest. Government cannot do anything much about that, so they just scared that, but they continue to build the road anyway. Um, there you go, same, same, same case with this house, doesn't want to give up the house. And we are all familiar with parking public spaces used as parking lots or being rented out. Uh, okay, this is the public space in Singapore. Uh, a public space is a public space. It cannot be used for private or semi-private use. And so to conclude, uh, if we want to push the idea of studying urban commons, I think we need to uh, we, we can continue to use the same frameworks we use in the study of traditional commons. Game theory is still a productive tool. We study public goods game or large and prisoner dilemma, dilemma games. You, we use the theory of collective action to study urban commons, the theory of property rights, uh, the theory of incomplete contracts, theory of market and government failures, theory of the commons and anti-commons, the tragedy of the commons. All of this, I think, are productive methodologies and tools to unpack and learn, study urban commons and global commons as, as well. So in summary, here's what we have learned from the traditional literature. We can we, we, I think uh, it's time for the traditional commons literature to move on and study other issues like global commons, space commons, and urban commons. I think I will end, end there, and I'm happy to take uh, questions now. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks, over to me. <laughs> thank you so much, Eduardo. <laughs> so, thank you so much for uh, a wonderful layout of uh, the way uh, the study of commons and collective actions have gone through over the years. And you rightly mentioned uh, that uh, most of the collective action and common studies uh, lie in the domain of rural commons, where we are also talking about the size uh, of the community, or we call it small n and large n in terms of uh, how the community is responding to the commons collectively um, in, in this manner. 
And uh, interestingly, you also showcase uh, the chronology of development of the common studies uh, in, in, the, in the global uh, perspective as well, through the authors, right from Harding to even uh, your work will date and to come into Michael Fox. Uh, so we, we see this whole trajectory of scholars in, uh, emerging and contesting the idea and developing the literature in the field. You also uh, do mention about uh, the new uh, domain emerging, which is the urban commons. And I recall IAS Hyderabad, when uh, when uh, some of the new entries to urban commons, even I, I have been fortunate enough to uh, present urban lakes there and we had uh, many more uh, sparks and all being discussed and you, you put it very uh, nicely so uh, maybe uh, before people ask questions here in the chat box and all uh, I think that Charlie and I can take a little bit of liberty to ask you questions uh, because <laughs> we are also from the same school and also encourage participants to put uh, in the chat box if they have questions. So uh, maybe I, uh, Charlie, do you want to start with your question or uh, I, I'm already sitting with questions to be honest. Uh, I can I can ask a question. Um, Please go ahead. I, I was uh, typing as you were talking to the audience members. Yes. Did you ask the question you put in chat, Nancy? Yes, I would like to ask the one question. Starting okay, why don't you ask that first? Yeah. Yeah. I will start with the other common question because uh, you rightly mentioned that uh, when we talk about collective action, it is not literally a linear uh, situation where good, uh, where collective action leads to our sustainable resource management. There, there are negative impacts of collective action as well. And uh, you, uh, you showed some wonderful uh, uh, images and instances of negative impacts in urban areas, whether it is pollution, water pollution, air pollution, congestion, or uh, any infrastructure development. And this is where my question lies and you have been to India and many parts of Asia as well. Uh, this unsustainable urban development. And mm -hmm. it is also a collective act, a collective decision, you know, by uh, those who know what is urbanization, those who know how things should go, those who are probably aware what may go wrong and all. So I'm, my question to you is actually, do you think that collective action in the boardroom can be considered, first of all, as a collective action. And it is multidisciplinary enough to take these decisions. Because you recall, just before the uh, talk, we were talking about uh, the Sardar Patel uh, uh, you know, statue, uh, although it's in a rural setup. But similar things happen in urban setups where a lot of development happens at the cost of displacement of poor people vulnerable people, those who are migrants from the rural areas at the cost of ecology. So uh, do you see the collective action really happening between the people who are really aware of many fields which are impacting urban development? Or so, do you Mazi, consider you're... it urban uh, collective action? Will you even consider it collective action, the boardroom decisions on development? Ah, okay. Interesting question. Whether boardroom decisions uh, on urban development is a collective action uh, problem. Um, well, uh, when we talk about collective action, there's usually a dilemma between self-interest and collective uh, interests. So in a sense that to the extent that the boardroom acts in behalf of the interest of the company, yeah. Uh, and they just go ahead and say, we are not willing to invest in uh, uh, equipment to, to clean up our pollution. We, we just used our uh, rivers and lakes to, to pollute. Then yes, it, uh, in that sense, uh, it's a collective action problem because they're only looking after their narrow self-interest. Uh, so if we, uh, so it's not just the, the, the boardroom, but the firm and series of firms making decisions to maximize their own welfare. And by doing so, by maximizing their own welfare, they harm uh, the collective good, even though they don't want it. So in that sense, yes, it is a collective action problem. 
because uh, firms and the board do, the board only look after their short term self interests and because they are competing with others they say that if i invest a lot on environmental goods and clean up my act while others don't don't do the same then i get disadvantage i am not competitive i'm putting a lot of money on environmental uh, things but my competitors are not investing so it doesn't make sense for me to put in a lot of money on this good so and 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 you don't know if you invest you don't know whether others would also invest again it's it's the same issue with climate change uh why why would india uh, pay the cost of uh, on climate change when others uh, have done much worse and uh, india is just developing and india does not have much alternative to coal and others it's still cheaper and you see you have billions of people so and uh, and you see others are still polluting and they're not doing enough so in a sense yes it is a collective action problem it's not just a board issue but also a political uh, issue and you know when you talk about collective action there's coordination problem there's a prisoner's dilemma uh there's many types of dilemmas that 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 we face uh, if if you think about it that way yeah thank you uh, when uh, when i meant uh, that it is a collective action because if there are private agencies if there is government agency there are politicians who are coming together to decide on certain path to development in i mean I'm, i will focus on indian context in cities and all so they in a way represent the whole community which is a urban community and most of the time this heterogeneous urban community is informed afterwards about what's coming up as a development instead of you know taking them on board as a uh, you know a participation more empowered participation it's more token mm -hmm. participation so that way i was foreseeing them as uh, collective action because being representative uh, so uh, taking example from water developments in india because i work in the water sector my question is that when a water development is coming up it is not a development per se it, uh, there are many other factors so if if uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, representatives if uh, the ecological representatives if uh, uh, you know uh, if the pollution representatives are not on board to decide the land development of the water or the irrigation development of the water mm. it becomes already incomplete um, uh, overview of the project itself and then uh, the impact is actually faced by the other uh, agencies which i am talking about i mean river front development to be honest uh, in ahmedabad mm. we've been here mm. uh, it was developed and then it is among the polluted rivers it has a biodiversity issue uh, but it has a, a social component econo economic component which has uh, been uh, really vouched for how do you mm. see this incomplete sense of collective uh, you know development yeah no yeah uh, that's that's a realistic question mansi uh because there's so many stakeholders involved and their interests are not uh, aligned with the broader interests or they're only looking at short term short term gains uh never mind the next generation never, never mind others uh yeah so that that's where the market fail that's where uh you cannot trust private interests to produce the public good uh that's where the government has to step in and make difficult decisions to align private interests with the public good right there's really a scope for government action uh to uh to bring stakeholders and to bring very di very different interest groups to the table and and uh, look after uh, the public uh, welfare not only this generation but also the the next uh, generation that's why i said in some of the theories about uh, collective action um i said the theory of uh, property rights the theory of anti commons uh, should be used to study uh, to to study this problem that the, the problem with our community is we are so stuck studying the traditional commons of irrigation fisheries 
and all that. And uh, we have not moved on really. And there's no, long, there's, there's no longer much, uh, uh, what is the aha and the big question uh, yeah. that we can study if we continue to beat this, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can, we should start to look at other commons, for example, digital commons, knowledge commons, yeah. space commons, urban commons, global commons, and yes. not, not just be, and, and, and as you said, you know, you know climate change, is just one example of uh, a global commons uh, problem. So <clears throat> even ours, among ourselves, people who study commons, uh, we couldn't get our acts together. Uh, <laughs> we have collective action problems among people who study yes. commons. <laughs> yes, that's very well put, very well put. Charlie, so, I... I uh... Yeah, I invite you to ask question, and then I will pull down. Okay. Yeah, I will. Um, and again, to the uh, attendees, if anybody, uh, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat if you have a, a question or a point you want to make. And again, we can make unmute you if you'd like to, to talk to Ed. But um, Ed, I think I'm going to, uh, I've got a couple things I want to ask you. And thank you for that, that talk and um, kind of that rich arc of um, uh, both work you've done over time and others have done over time. I'm going to go back and look at this video again to make sure I tracked some of the important papers you raised. Um, I appreciated that temporal arc you went through. Um, I, I guess uh, first a really simple question, a small point maybe, is uh, you just mentioned the anti-commons and um, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit more of what you're thinking there. When I think of anti-commons, I think of um, Michael Heller and uh, the, um, the, the, the problems of patent thickets um, where innovation is not happening because of um, uh, intellectual property get, uh, law getting in the way. Um, are, are, is that where you're coming from with the, the point about anti-commons or are there other, part, other concepts that I'm not familiar with? Right, right, right. No, thank, thank you, Charlie. Yes, uh, of course, we, we know that it's Michael Heller who, who uh, enlightened us about the anti-commons. So, uh, yes, the, the problem of hold up uh, on patents. But the examples I also showed you about the, the nail house in China, those houses who don't want to give up their houses for, for public good, those are well, well known in China as... Uh, uh, the problem of anti-commons, but mm -hmm. it's not just in patents, but also uh, in the technology field, and and you know it's used to explain why uh, big tech companies are hoarding up and buying small startups uh, to to prevent them from uh, uh, invoking the pro the, uh, the uh, to prevent them from engaging in the hold up problem, and not just pharmaceutical, okay. but big big tech but uh, in other big uh, industries uh, as well. Okay, so um, the concept, sorry. Yes, yes. The, the concept is much more expansive than I was thinking it was. So that's, that's helpful for me. Thank yeah, you. it's a general problem of, of uh, the, uh, the hold up problem and how, how do you solve the hold up problems in uh, not just in, on the issue of uh, patents. Great. So the, um, two other questions I wanted to ask you. Um, I was taken aback by your um, two studies, the really long historical studies uh, that you mentioned. And I want to look at those. Um, um, the second one was uh, the 400 year old study and it had to do with climate adaptation. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, you know, much of your work or some of your work has been in uh, the area of irrigation, I think, and in, in that area, correct? Yes. So um, I, I, what's your sense in terms of the variability due to climate um, and the impacts of that on the robustness of self-governing communities? Um, uh, do you have a sense of that? I mean, um, yeah, no, that that case study on the Sangheras, uh, it's it's one of those case studies that Lynn actually used in her 1990 book. Yeah, that's why she made me promise to 
uh, revisit it much, much later. And uh, between, so that paper was, the original paper was published in 1984. And Ruth Yammerman of ASU also studied that. And then I went back to that place in 2008 and it's still standing there. So going back to your question, has it got to do the, the, the robustness of the system? Has it got to do with the fact that it's uh, uh, year in, year out, it's subjected to a lot of, uh, strains. Uh, I think, yes, uh, the system was designed to survive the uh, this 20 typhoons, droughts, and earthquakes uh, a year. That's a year, right? Mm. Uh, on, uh, on average. The system oh, was explicitly, imagine Florida buffeted by 20 uh, category 5 typhoons every year, <laughs> And that community just designed the system how to get back every time the typhoon swipes them and and survive the next drought uh, and and so on. that's that's what the what the story is all about. Okay. So it was implicitly designed to survive this type of uh, uh, typhoons and and uh, so and, and the robust, and the design is robust, obviously. They have survived for 200 years, uh, 400 years. It was built on the principles of fairness, uh, low transaction cost. transaction cost. Every time there's no need to convene or there's no need to rule and there's no need to punish free riders. It's an automatic mechanism that people mo mobilize because it's everyone's interest to, uh, to repair the brush dump. Because if, if you don't repair it, then uh, the next typhoon will come, then the whole system will just come crashing down and collapse. The second one is that the elites and the leaders of the community, their land parcels are actually at the bottom of the irrigation canal uh, where there's no water. So they have incentive to make sure that water flows down from the headwaters all the way to their part. Uh, so everybody knows that the leader of the irrigation, his land is at the bottom of the canal. So he has incentive to make sure that the system is fair and the system mm -hmm. is low transaction cost. So that people don't, so they don't have, they, they have to do away with enforcement and monitoring and all that stuff. It's kind of self-voluntary. Uh, so, so low transaction cost and it's fair. And I think those two principles uh, were, I would say, the uh, the uh, mechanisms that led the community to survive for more than 400 years, despite this continuous barrage of uh, problems. Mm. Um, so that's that's a story of that 400 year old uh, Sanghera. The other one, the 2,000 year old system, it's much more sophisticated because they uh, there are no formal courts, no written rules. It's just uh, norms. Uh, monitoring, self-monitoring, uh, the role of religion. Again, it's transaction costs, uh, bringing down the cost of compliance. Okay. Um, so if, if you have those two elements, I think the system would be robust. If, if they are fair and low transaction costs, the system would, would, would stand a good chance of surviving climate, uh, climate changes. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I get a hold of those papers because it seems like there's a lot of rich information in there for uh, for uh, uh, other other cases to learn from in terms of robustness and, and maintaining uh, collective action um, over time. Um, let me just pause again and just make sure uh, there isn't an attendee that wants to ask a question. I have one other one that I'd like to ask, but. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a question here about uh, Mans is asking the use of time series. Yes, uh, it's a similar question as Charlie was posing, and because you use the transaction cost uh, as as you know uh, approach, I will say. Uh, but because nowadays I'm teaching a social ecological system framework, so I was just wondering if uh, it can be a useful tool or a framework, uh, a toolbox or a framework to really do a time series of uh, a resource, you know, and how, what should be your advice 
for uh, students to really use SES framework? Yeah, the, the, the one that we use in China uh, is just a one, one, one time off. It's not a time series, but yes. uh, we use structural okay. equation modeling okay. um, and all sorts of fancy uh, econometrics before we can pass through the editors of ecology and uh, society. Uh, yeah. Marco, Marco gave us a difficult time for that, but we, we passed <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we can pass through his journal. So, but yes, I would encourage you, but of course time series is a very difficult and expensive uh, uh, project to, to, to collect. If you have one, yes, uh, please, please go ahead. Your next question, where are we in AI for good? Uh, in, in the in commons, the commons is, uh, I've been thinking about this. I'm, uh, I, 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 this is one of the subjects I now teach uh, in Sing Singapore on, on, on AI, even, even blockchain, the study yeah. of uh, blockchain. A lot of people, uh, when they realize or when they hear that I, I was a student of Lean and I work on commons, they ask me lots of questions about, uh, about uh, blockchain as a self-governing community, Actually, uh, yes. cryptocurrency. And, and uh, they, they love to hear all this stuff, decentralization, self-governance, all the stuff. Uh, at, at, at the end of the day, they, they end up with a FTX as an exchange. It's a highly centralized exchange. Yes. Ethereum uh, stake of concept is a highly centralized mechanism. Uh, they hide they hide behind the uh, words of decentralization and self governance, but in practice they are actually anything but decentralized and self governed. They are really really centralized <laughs> centralized mechanism, and they centralized and more and more, AI. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, blockchain. Uh, yeah. For for AI, it's it's more like the anti commons uh, thing, uh, and. Yes. Uh, and uh, what, what I said, the behavior of platform companies is no different from pharmaceutical companies. They buy, up, yeah. they buy startups. Uh, uh, the next time they see a good startup, it looks like a threat to them. And then they, they, they buy them early. They buy, it out. They, they, they buy them out. They try to integrate. And that's what Metaverse is doing. That's what Google did. That's what Amazon yeah. did. That's what they all do. So I think it's a productive theoretical framework to study the behavior of these platform companies from the lens of anti-commons. Uh, it's not that uh, these companies are uh, working to, to serve a holdout, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's a productive space to study. I have not uh, written anything about it, but I do think about it uh, from time to time, maybe future commons uh, in yeah. Nairobi, we can have a panel on AI or blockchain as commons governance, you know, non-traditional non commons basically. And yes. what, what can we, uh, and climate change basically as, uh, as a global commons uh, uh, problem. Uh, everybody talks about COP27, COP28, but the race, race to the top, and we, we, we only have, what, 20, 30 years before scientists say that the clock will, will run out. So yeah, it's a race to the top. It's a, it's a collective action problem, basically. So, um, um, interestingly, you raised these global common issues and I, I, I want to bring uh, the discussion further to uh, the very localized common where corruption is also a classic case of collective action. And it works so well, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, without any written rules or, uh, but you rightly mentioned in blockchain situation where it looks decentralized, but it is highly centralized through yeah. some system. I, I have a paper in public administration review action. looking at 38 yeah. countries in Africa. It's a time series with 8,000 data points. Uh, yeah, the conclusion is that uh, uh, corruption is raised to the bottom. It's make yes. hay while well, the sunshine, the sunshine. <laughs> yes. So, and, and we yes. show this empirically with data from sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a collective and, and corruption, the, the organized type of corruption is, is a collective action problem. Uh, people don't, yeah. 
the, the, the way to break down corruption is when somebody blows the whistle, but that's a collective action problem uh, also. You can think about breaking down corrupt, corruption from the prism of collective uh, collective action. Whistleblower, anti-commons, the problem of hold up. Uh, yeah, you can extend these concepts to so many other uh, collective action problems outside of the traditional literature. So Interestingly, collective yeah. action literature is more uh, well, uh, annotated with uh, you know uh, the positive side of it or the optimistic side of it, whereas we see these examples. So I will stop here and over to you, Charlie. Uh, well, you both covered uh, a lot of territory in those in that ten <laughs> minutes. Um, uh, I'll just add, um, you know, one area. It's not. It's it's more of a, a, a tool area. I'm going back to the AI question. Um, more of a tool area for the study of commons, but also policy and other things. Um, um, in uh, that, there's now this uh, fairly large groups using the uh, uh, institutional grammar tool um, and applying AI machine learning to uh, pulling out the governance structures, the rule systems um, using uh, yeah th th those tools and. Um, I think in the Nairobi conference, and I'm about to turn to closing now, but in the Nairobi conference, uh, Saba Siddiqui uh, um, and others will be there talking about that along with uh, Seth Fry and his really interesting work on using machine learning to study the, the uh, rules in self-governing communities online. Um, so that's a really exciting area, I think, of application mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. AI to um, institutional analysis. Um, the, the, I'll, 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 I'm going to turn to close closing, but I, I did want to say one thing. Um, Ed, you're, you know, you're in a school of public policy, and um, uh, some of some of the other folks that I interact with at, at, around IESC, we've been talking about the possibility of doing a them thematic conference, the way we've been doing with Knowledge Commons and. Uh, there was one in food commons last year and others, uh, urban commons. Um, we've, been, I, we've been talking about doing something around either public policy in the support of commoning, or I like to use the phrase state reinforced self-governance. Um, and that's something when I look back at IESC conferences, I know it's embedded there in a lot of different talks um, more generally, but I think there might be a productive dialogue we could have as a community specifically focusing in on the interaction of public policy, the public sector and in support of self-governing communities. And so I'm just curious very quickly, we're, we're now a minute over, um, what, what your reaction to that is Ed, given you're, you're in a school of public policy. Right, no, no, thank you, Charlie. Yes, absolutely. I do believe in the role of public policy the role of government in solving a lot of collective action problems, especially uh, certain collective issues of scale. So certainly communities can solve small local problems, but you, know, you probably don't need governments around that, but there are many problems out there that small communities cannot uh, solve. Uh, as you've seen, the urban commons problem, governments really have to step in and solve a lot of those problems that communities by themselves cannot uh, do and or Markets will, will fail, communities will fail. Government certainly has a role to play in creating incentives, facilitating, uh, 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 creating platforms, providing opportunities. I'd like to think of government not just in a uh, the uh, public choice way as a uh, predator or an enemy, but an enabler of a collective action. I mean, think about COVID-19. Uh, it's not the private sector, it's not small scale collective action that got us through this, but it's really large scale government and global cooperation, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, there's, there ought to be a role for government in uh, promoting certain types of collective action and where government should not step in, but also encouraging and creating incentives for communities to, uh, to take collective action. Yeah, well, I would love to have another conversation with you about that. Um, I'm thinking of maybe something in 2024 um, in the off year between the biennial conferences that maybe we could have a, 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 an online conference perhaps explicitly around 
policy and commoning or self state reinforced uh, self governance. Um, so I, I would love to talk to you more if you're intrigued or anybody else in the attendees. Sure. <laughs> um, and, and, the, you know, I come from Singapore. So the state plays here a, a very outsized role compared to other governments, uh, you know. So, <laughs> yes. Well, I, at, at this point, I think I'm going to close unless we see any other questions. Um, Mansi, let me know if there are any, but um, uh, hopefully you can see my screen at this point. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So I just want to, um, as we're closing, just want to uh, thank. Ed, for the great talk and the preparation for the talk, uh, and Mency for organizing the talk. I really appreciate it. Um, again, this is one of our regional keynote uh, talks uh, during this World Commons Week, and I happy World Commons Week. I hope you share uh, the, the word that this is our celebration week um, to your colleagues. Um, what you're seeing here is we, we had a... Uh, a video um, contest. And if you go to the, the uh, World Commons Week 2022 website, um, the three finalists are up there and there's voting happening this week. Um, we're gonna close that on the 10th. Um, just to give you a, 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 in case you didn't see others, so we've, we've already had the Africa talk. Um, that video is now up on the um, World Commons Week uh, website and on YouTube. Um, uh, we had another uh, really wonderful talk by Aaron Matakari, uh, Matariki Kar um, from Oceana. Um, this was a brilliant talk about um, uh, the Maori culture and a hack that they did in the legal system to actually treat a forest as a living being um, that's now in New Zealand law. It was a fascinating talk. Um, that one is up on YouTube and on, on the website, and I really encourage people to look at these if they haven't seen them. Um, we did, uh, Javier gave his talk this morning, about 10 hours ago. Um, I don't have that one yet on the website, but that'll be there. And it was a really fascinating talk about his work and his team's work around uh, local and global lessons on aquatic food systems. Um, uh, just uh, about an hour and a half ago, uh, China finished theirs. Um, and I, I will again work with uh, Yahoo to get that on um, the website, the recording. Um, now your your time, your day, and now in fact, I'm on the same day. It's, it's now uh, a little after midnight, my time. Um, so later today, um, Latin America um, will be the, the keynote address for, for Latin America will be given. Um, and that Zoom uh, link is on the website. If anybody, uh, I know it'll be late for you guys, but <laughs> um, uh, right. again, that'll be recorded. Um, on the 9th in Europe, Giuseppe will be giving his talk. Um, so again, that look for that on the website. And then we're gonna close on the 10th with our early career network, which as IAC people know, it's a really vibrant, uh, wonderful uh, community of scholars. Um, and we're gonna close with two of them talking about the early career network and growing together as an intellectual community. And I hope we can get a nice audience to support that um, really important up and rising uh, research colleagues. I'll close with by just reminding people that uh, the biannual conference in Nairobi, Kenya is coming up next June. And uh, the call for abstracts, which was only 250 words, is closes on December 12th. So we're getting close to that closing date um, for people to know. Um, I wanna thank my co-organizers on the screen for their help. And uh, I'll just leave this up. Um, again, uh, I hope, Anybody on the on the Zoom, I hope to meet you in person in Nairobi. And uh, and if you're not an ISC member, become an ISC member. We're we're having really important dialogues, especially this day and age when we need these dialogues. Um, we've always ha always have, but it feels at least when I talk to my students, increasingly important um, given the world they feel like they're inheriting. So with that. Um, Ed, thank you. Mansi, thank you. Thank you, thank so you to the audience for, for attending. And I hope whatever time zone you're in, you have a great rest of your day.
Thank you. Thanks, yep. Ed, and thanks, Charlie. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Bye. Thank you, Matsi. I hope thank to see you, you in Nairobi. Bye. Oh, great. Yes, I, I hope so. You all. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm going to turn this off.